Welcome to the July 27th, 2020 Troy City Council meeting. I'll call this meeting to order and uh, ask Ms. Dixon to do roll call. Mayor Baker? Here. Councilmember Abraham? Here. Councilmember Brooks? Here. Councilmember Chamberlain Kranga? Here. Councilmember Erickson Galt? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Hamilton? Here. Councilmember Hoderick? Here. All present. First on the agenda this evening, we have no certificates of recognition or special presentations. There are no carryover items. There are no public hearings. So we go straight into public comment. Uh, City Clerk Dixon, had, was there public comment submitted this evening? Yes, Mayor. Um, we have one email and two voicemails for you tonight. Okay. So the first public comment is from Skylar Oyen. The Troy Public Library has a history of providing exemplary service to the citizens of Troy. In the 1990s and 2000s, the library ranked among the best in the state of Michigan and received numerous awards and accolades. TPL operated seven days a week and much of its staff worked full time. Since 2011, TPL has been operating on a shoestring budget funded only by a meager millage of 0.7 mills that has been barely sufficient to keep the lights on before the COVID-19 pandemic struck, the library was operating six days per week with only 55 hours of weekly service provided due to insufficient funds. Director Kathy Russ and her exemplary staff should be commended for doing so much with so little. Unfortunately, inadequate funding continues to plague TPL. The vast majority of the library's dedicated staff work 20 or fewer hours per week. This has resulted in supervisors juggling the schedules of an inordinately large roster of part-time workers, as well as staff retention issues because the pay and hours are not competitive with other area libraries. The building's low ceiling coupled with antiquated structural and architectural design pose significant usage limitations. Building upkeep costs will only continue to spike until new construction or a substantial renovation can be completed. The solution to these dilemmas is a sustained long-term source of revenue that allocates sufficient funds for structural upgrades and replacements on a predictable cadence. Therefore, I implore the City Council to place before Troy voters a long-term 10-year millage of 1.1 mills or greater. A millage of one mill or less for only five or eight years simply will not generate sufficient revenue to revive the award-winning library with modern facilities and programming that the citizens have come to expect. Furthermore, the library survey conducted earlier this month understates support for the, the larger TPL millage option of 1.1 mills. Many of those opposed to the 0 0.9 and 1.0 millage options were opposed because they would not raise in, because they would raise insufficient revenue. I believe that a better worded and more widely distributed survey would show broad public support for 1.1 mills or greater funding. Thank you. And now we have two voicemails. Roger Walter, I'd like to ask Ms. Brooks, would you like to be the next mayor of the city of Troy? Since we have such a big racial divide here in the city of Troy, and I've lived here since 1957, as you've noticed that nobody in the city council are black. We've never had black council members. We've never had any black people sit on our board. I would like to say to Mrs. Brooks that when it comes down to voting next time, I will vote for you for mayor of the city of Troy to break the racial divide in this city. Ms. Brooks, can you tell me how many black officers are in Troy? Probably like zero to none. Thank you, Ms. Brooks. And Mr. Baker, we do need a dividing between white and black people. We don't have that here. Mrs. Brooke is the only person that I'm going to respect from here on out. Thank you. Mr. Baker, this is Adam Wentworth. I am asking you, and I'm going to tell you, all students in the city of Troy School District must be tested before they go back to school. In the Detroit School District, all students must be tested. In the Troy School District, every single Troy student 
should be tested for COVID-19. If you do not implement that, you are not in compliance with the CDC. All the students must be tested for COVID-19. Any student coming from that school, going home and not being tested before going into a school district, into a classroom, is a failure of Richard Majewski. Every single student in Troy School District must be tested for COVID-19. If not, there will be a federal lawsuit. Please understand one thing. If you let kids go back into the Troy School District without being tested, there will be a federal lawsuit. You can guarantee it. The so Richard Majewski has to test every single person going back into Troy School District. If not, there'll be a shutdown in Troy School District. Is that to guarantee, Mr. Baker? You know, you need to do your job instead of making a hundred and some thousand dollars a year. You just actually need to do your job as a little boy because you don't know Troy. Well, that concludes those that have submitted public comment for this evening's meeting. As a reminder, as long as we're having virtual meetings, public comment can be submitted either via email to public comment at troymi.gov or via voicemail 248-524-3302. Same rules apply. You have three minutes and they will be read into the record as, or listened to as they just were by the city clerk. Um, and now's the opportunity for City Council or City Administration to address and discuss anything uh, to the residents who brought public comments forward. Would anybody like to bring anything up or respond? I will only say one thing, actually two things. Um, the first one is obviously we'll have ample discussion about the library and funding as we head into I-6, that uh, item on our agenda. So I don't feel the need to necessarily address um, Skylar Oyen right at this moment, obviously. And the other one is, as a reminder for all of those watching tonight, uh, as the mayor of the city of Troy, I make $175 a month uh, as the total. So just to, we on city council do not make uh, full-time salaries. And so just to be very clear on that, appreciate that. And also we do not control the school district's decision-making processes. We certainly are free to give our individual personal um, opinions to Dr. Macheski and any school board members. And I certainly will pass along the information received tonight from Mr. Uh, Wentworth about testing, but it won't be a decision that comes through Troy City Council or City Administration. That's the Troy School Board and school, uh, school District decision only. So thank you for your public comment this evening. We appreciate it. Uh, next on the agenda is um, post post items, postponed items, there are none. So we move on to regular business. I have one mayoral appointment this evening. I'd like to move that the mayor of City of Troy hereby appoints Cheryl Bush to the Downtown Development Authority for the term expiring September 30th, 2020. Support. Uh, moved by the chair, supported by Council Member Chamberlain Crianga that the Troy City Council and Mayor appoint Cheryl Bush to the Downtown Development Authority for the term expiring September 30th, 2020. Any discussion? The vote, Ms. Dixon. Mayor Baker? Yes. Council Member Abraham? Yes. Councilmember Brooks? Yes. Councilmember Chamberlain Krenga? Yes. Councilmember Erickson Galt? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Hamilton? Yes. Councilmember Hoderick? Yes. Motion carries. Uh, thank Ms. Bush very much for willing to be on the Downtown Development Authority. Look forward to having her on the board. Um, that concludes mayoral appointments this evening. There are no city council appointments, so we move on to I2, mayoral and city council nominations. There are no mayoral nominations this evening, but there are some city council nominations that I understand. So I'll turn it over to Mayor Pro Tem Hamilton. Thank you, Mayor. I have four nominations to three different boards. So I'm gonna do each board separately. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to nominate David Height to the Liquor Advisory Committee uh, for the term expiring January 31st, 2022. Support. Support. Moved by Mayor Pro Tem Hamilton, supported by Council Member Ann Erickson Galt, that City Council nominates David Height to the Liquid Advisory Council uh, for the term expiring 
I missed the term. <laughs> January 31st. January 31st. 2022. As stated in the record by Mayor Pro Tem Hamilton. Um, any discussion? The vote, Ms. Dixon. Councilmember Abraham? Yes. Councilmember Brooks? Yes. Councilmember Chamberlain Kranga? Yes. Councilmember Erickson Galt? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Hamilton? Yes. Councilmember Hoderick? Yes. Mayor Baker? Yes. Motion carries. Mayor Pro Tem Hamilton? And I'll move to nominate David Height and Ann Sackerson to the personnel board for the terms expiring April 30th, 2023. Support. Moved by Mayor Pro Tem Hamilton, supported by Council Member Chamberlain Crianga that we nominate David Height and Ann Sackerson to the personnel board for the terms expiring April 30th, 2023. Any discussion? The vote, Ms. Dixon. Council Member Brooks? Yes. Council Member Chamberlain Kranga? Yes. Council Member Erickson Galt? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Hamilton? Yes. Council Member Hoderick? Yes. Mayor Baker? Yes. Councilmember Abraham? Yes. Motion carries. And fin finally, to the Zoning Board of Appeals, I would like to nominate Aaron Green to the full position that expires on April 30th, 2022. Support. Moved by Mayor Pro Tem Hamilton, supported by Councilmember Abraham, him, that we appoint Aaron Green to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Nominate. Sorry, nominate, yeah. we nominate Aaron Green to the Zoning Board of Appeals for the term expiring April 30th, 2022. And the, uh, Scott, I was, we, we got oh. it. I think it was supported by <laughs> Councilmember Abraham. Thank you. Um, it was so supportive, we wanted to do it again, I guess. Uh, any discussion? The vote, Ms. Dixon. Councilmember Chamberlain Krenga? Yes. Councilmember Erickson Galt? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Hamilton? Yes. Councilmember Hoderick? Yes. Mayor Baker? Yes. Councilmember Abraham? Yes. Councilmember Brooks? Yes. Motion carries. That's all I got. Thank you. All right. Thank you. That concludes City Council nominations for this evening to boards and committees. There's uh, no request for closed session, so we move on to I-4, Standard Purchasing Resolution 2, Sole Bidder Meeting Specifications and Budget Amendment Studio B and C for replacement at the Troy Community Center. And this will be introduced by Recreation Director Elaine Bo, who joins us. Welcome, Elaine. Good evening, everybody. Um, our studio floors are on the second floor of the Community Center. And these two rooms that we're talking about are typically used for our recital dance program, Zumba classes, and um, some exercise classes in between those. and the subfloor is failing. Um, we initially thought it was going to be a repair. And coincidentally, after the capital project process was completed, it was determined we needed to replace the entire floor. It's a, not ideal that we've been closed since March. However, <laughs> in this case, it would be ideal to do this project now because we are closed and the company would have to come in and take down a, a removable wall that divides these two rooms. And that's in this cost as well. Um, so we are looking for approval to do this project. And um, as I stated, it does include taking down and putting up the wall and the floor repair. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Any questions for Elaine this evening? I don't see any. Someone like to move the resolution. All oh, Councilmember Erickson Gall. <laughs> Gotta unmute myself here. Okay. I'll move I four standard purchasing resolution two sole bidder meeting specifications and budget amendment, Studio B and C floor replacement, Troy Community Center as printed in the agenda. Support. Support. 
Moved by Councilmember Erickson to also supported by Councilmember Abraham that we approve I-4 standard purchasing resolution 2, sole bidder meeting specifications and budget amendment, Studio B and C floor replacement at the Troy Community Center as printed in the agenda packet. Any discussion? Okay, the, the vote, Ms. Dixon. Councilmember Erickson Galt? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Hamilton? Yes. Councilmember Hoderick? Yes. Mayor Baker? Yes. Councilmember Abraham? Yes. Councilmember Brooks? Yes. Councilmember Chamberlain Kringa? Yes. Motion carries. Nice to see you, Elaine. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Next on the agenda is I-5, Contract Ratification, Troy Police Officers Association, TPOA, to be introduced by Human Resources Director, Jeanette Menig. And I also understand that we have two of our representatives from the police department on if we have additional questions for them. So I'll hand it over to you, Jeanette. Nice to see you. Hi, Hi Mayor and Council. Um, I'm here tonight to introduce the tentative agreement we reached with the Troy Police Officers Association, also known as TPOA. Uh, the TPOA currently represents 81 sworn officers in Troy. And the agreement as presented in the packet increases wages, shift premiums, clothing and cleaning allowances, it removes a higher date driven tier system for retirement contributions to the 401 defined contribution plan. And it updates uh, several items of administrative language. Uh, the union has already held their ratification vote and approved the agreement and city management supports and recommends ratifying this agreement. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, are there any questions for Jeanette? or anybody else to city management. Not seeing any. Council Member Abraham, would you like to move the resolution? <laughs> Thank you, Mayor, I would. Let me get to the right spot in the agenda. I'd like to move I-5, Contract Ratification, Troy Police Officers Association, TPOA, as printed. Support. Moved by Councilmember Abraham and supported by Councilmember Hoderick that we approve I-5 contract ratification Troy Police Officers Association TPOA as printed in the agenda. Any discussion? Councilmember Hoderick. I just want to um, thank city management and the TPOA team for coming together um, and negotiating uh, in good faith and coming to the conclusions that seem to be right on what we need from a fiscally responsible way, as well as um, doing the best we can uh, for, for our police officers. And it seems an appropriate time to make sure that we acknowledge the contribution our officers make to this community. And um, we know the hard work that's out there under any circumstances. There's a lot of division in our society right now, and we know you're serving in the midst of a pandemic in the midst of um, just a pile of crazy. Um, and we do appreciate that. Um, I know I shouldn't speak for all of council, but I suspect they would all nod with, we're, we're saying we do appreciate you and we do recognize what you do for us. Um, I've been around for a while um, and worked in city staff years ago when we first went through a downturn and watched um, the Troy Police Officers Union step up to help uh, really truly on a personal level, each of them um, mitigate the impact of the downturn. And at that time, the failure of this community to support a, um, an operating millage. And I was astounded um, by the character that our police department showed and how much they do care about the community. There were a tremendous number of cuts that went on. Um, since then, I do hope the officers recognize over time, each council since then has done its best to restore what it could, when it could, and to have your backs as you have ours in the community. It takes the entire community locking arms with our officers to truly create the community policing that we enjoy here. Um, I think there's some 18,000 police departments across this nation. 
And while there's a national dialogue on it, each department is specific to its community. And having lived here a long time, um, raised my children here, I just wanna say how much I value um, our peace officers. And I know the challenges that are, that are faced because I've gotten to know a number of them over the years, current and retired. So we appreciate you. And I appreciate that this contract um, has come forward in this time frame, and that uh, we will continue to lock arms as best we can um, to serve the community and protect the safety of the community. Thanks. Additional discussion? Just briefly, I mean, I, pretty much everything that Ellen just said is, is, is really, really good. I, it is an odd, it's a, it's a strange time in our, in our country as we look at police uh, departments and we, we look at um, everything that's happened and everything that's going on in this conversation um, and the different conversations that are coming as a result of the, what's happened in our country. But you know, I'm reminded as I read today an email from City Manager Miller and read it in the news about um, you know, a crime that was committed in Troy over the weekend that our police department went and had to and to, to work to keep the neighborhood safe and do everything. And just what a top-notch job they do at controlling the situation to keep our community safe. Um, and couple that with the very impressive social media presence that our police department has for communication, for open communication and transparency, and the educating they've been doing to our community over the past several weeks. I, I really do appreciate um, each and every one of you. And I know, um, I know I, I wasn't around when Ellen was around before and talking about the experience you've gone through, but I witnessed those as a resident of the city of Troy. And I, I'm also very thankful and appreciate very much um, the CPOA and, and everyone at the Troy Police Department. So thank you. And thank you for coming to this agreement now and working with city management and Mark and Jeanette and the team that worked on that. Thank you for doing that as always in good faith and working with the union to, to have something that makes sense for the, and is fair for the police department and as well as good for our city administration, our residents. So thank you to all involved, really appreciate it. Um, there's no other discussion, I'll the vote, Ms. Dixon. Mayor Persham Hamilton? Yes. Council Member Hoderick? Yes. Mayor Baker? Yes. Council Member Abraham? Yes. Councilmember Brooks? Yes. Councilmember Chamberlain Kranga? Yes. Councilmember Erickson Galt? Yes. Motion carries. Uh, thank you, Jeanette. Nice to see you. And um, we move on to I 6, which is library funding, It'll be presented by Assistant City Manager Bob Bruner and Library Director Kathy Russ, also here. And I know that. Uh, William St. Amour from Cobalt, I believe will also, we get to see his face this week, but we didn't get to see him, we just got to hear him last week. So looking forward to this presentation. Uh, so Bob, I'll turn it over to you, I believe, first. Uh, th thanks, Mr. Mayor. Tonight, we are gonna have two presentations. William will go first, and he's gonna present the um, final results of the, uh, the survey. Got a sneak preview um, last Monday, and so he's he's going to give us the uh, final results on that, and then that uh, I'll follow that up with a presentation about library funding more broadly. So, William, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Bob. I think you can see and hear me now. Um, I believe your uh, IT folks are going to be putting the presentation up momentarily. And as they bring it up, let me just cover some background information on who Cobalt is and about the study in general. So Cobalt is a 501c3 not-for-profit research coalition. So our mission is really to provide research and education for local units of government as they deal with issues not only in terms of placemaking, but also in terms of budget and planning and all of these kinds of issues that you're, you're working through. Um, we're developed to meet the research needs not only of local governments, but also schools and other nonprofit organizations as well. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. And then the next one as well. Okay, why research matters. I always like to throw this slide in just to provide some additional context. Uh, first, understanding community values and priorities certainly helps you plan and communicate more effectively about the city decisions that you're looking at making. Uh, understanding perception helps you to improve and promote our library services and also helps you kind of manage the, the outreach. So if there is something that people understand or if they don't understand it, 
you can have some of that context to be able to, to communicate more effectively with your residents. Uh, it supports uh, difficult decisions. So if you're looking at issues with limited resources and you need to make some sort of changes, having this kind of uh, quantitative data can be useful in looking at what are the, the concerns of the various groups represented within the community uh, and to see how consistent those concerns are across different demographic groups. And really it's a bottom line uh, practice to maintain trust, to maintain that relationship with the community uh, that's so important these days. Next slide, please. So let's talk about the study goals. So first we wanted to guide millage and budget planning decisions, particularly around the library. Uh, we wanted to look at the uh, current and potential future services and amenities, um, see what's valued by the community, what would people like to see the most, and again, how that breaks across different demographic groups within the community. We wanted to look at various millage options. So is the community interested in supporting any of the options? Um, and if they are, which particular options have the most resonance with them? And then finally, to make sure that the voices, again, of those various demographic groups are clearly heard and understood so you can have all the information you need to make a good decision uh, from a quantitative standpoint and then combining that with the qualitative information that I will present, uh, really giving you a robust foundation for making decisions uh, and having discussions that you need to have. Uh, next slide, please. I like to jump to the bottom line so that uh, you don't flip to the end of the presentation before I get there. So certainly there is mil there, there is majority support for the millage options. Uh, the activities that are most used by residents in the last 12 months are checking out library materials, browsing, and attending and viewing various programs and events. Uh, we looked at the overall satisfaction of the services provided by the library. And this was on a scale of one to 10, and folks gave us a 9.0 on a 10 point scale. Uh, just to give that some additional context, we pulled that into the American Customer Satisfaction Index, which is a, a national benchmarking tool that we work with, uh, and that's on a scale of 0 to 100. And the library scored an overall score of 89, which is very solid. And again, to put that in context, for similarly sized uh, libraries across the state of Michigan, uh, the score is an 83, so you're outperforming by about six points. And for similarly sized libraries across the United States, it's 81. So uh, Troy is doing a very nice job with the resources that they have available. And as we'll get into this a little bit more, there are certainly some opportunities uh, to, to level that up. Um, improvements and additions that residents would like to see, there's four things that really jumped out. The number one thing is really being open more days per week. That was far and away the top thing that people wanted to see uh, changed and addressed going forward. Uh, people would also like to see more film and music events, uh, more hours per day, and more author and literacy events. Next slide, please. So with the bottom line out of the way, let me talk about the methodology a little bit. We did a random sample of 3,000 residents, and this is from uh, the most recent uh, gubernatorial election, so it's a random sample of that particular data set. Uh, we drew that with random.org, so this is a utility that uses uh, atmospheric noise essentially to generate true random numbers, and they're based out of uh, Trinity College in Ireland. Uh, we heard back from 459 residents that were part of the sample. Uh, and this was just a, a quick one wave sample. And this is a very solid response rate. So uh, it's 15%, that gave us a conventional margin of error, plus or minus 4.6%, uh, really strong turnout for a pretty quick uh, survey that was put out to get the information that we needed to, to have. One of the questions that often comes up is for a community your size, is 459 responses enough for you to make the kind of decisions that you want to make. And for a national survey with a margin of error plus or minus 5%, you really only need 384 responses with the random sampling process to reflect the population of the entire country. Uh, and the fact that you have 459 really puts you in a good place from a data perspective. In addition to those 459 residents, we did open the survey for other folks in the community that wanted to share their concerns and their, their priorities. And we heard from about 1,056 people um, so that gives you a total response of 1,515. Now, the non-sample responses were not included in the overall all results, uh, but we do have a separate line in the cross tabs. And as I go through the graphs uh, today, I will show you both results of the uh, sample and also of the folks who are not part of the sample. And really, overall, it was a very consistent kind of message and movement on the graphs. Uh, one other note from a methodological standpoint, is that the results that I provide for the overall um, 
were weighted to match mo uh, voter files. And so the details of that weighting and, and the response pattern are available with cost tabs that you have available. Okay, that's enough of the boring stuff. I keep hitting page down to go to the next slide. So uh, next slide, please. Okay, one of the tools that you have are the cross tabs. And these are very important. This particular sample is scientifically designed to not be legible on your screens. Um, but the main purpose of this particular demonstration is to show you how the chart works and how to read it. So every question in the survey has its own row. So if you go across, you can see quiet reading and browsing and checking out library materials. Um, and this is just a sample of some of the questions in the cross tabs. Uh, but everything has its own row, and then every demographic group uh, has its own row. So you can see residents, how long people have lived here, age, how, how old people are, uh, non deadline. And again, this is just a tiny snapshot of the different demographic groups that are available. The key thing is the shading. So if you look at the, the blue and the red and the checkering, um, if it's uh, blue, it tends to be a higher number. If it's red, it's a lower number. Um, and if it's consistently blue or consistently red, it's telling you that regardless of demographic group, people have responded pretty consistently. And if there's some checkering, that means that there may be some differences that you want to uh, consider uh, in terms of how people responded. Next slide, please. So let's start diving into the results in a bit more detail. Next slide. Okay. So first we ask people, what do you do at the library? And you can see these blue and green columns. Uh, the blue represents the random sample, and the green represents the uh, folks who are not part of the sample. And again, you can see there's a very, very strong uh, correlation between those two groups. So the top things, as I mentioned, checking out library material was number one, uh, then browsing was number two, and then attending was number three item. Next slide. Satisfaction with the library, again, this is on a scale of one to 10. Uh, very strong results for the library, uh, particularly with the uh, safety and security. People do feel very safe when they're in the facilities. The lowest score was the hours of operations, uh, which would be inclusive of the days that it's available as well. Uh, next slide, please. When we looked at the desired future services programs and amenities, uh, the number one thing that came up uh, was open uh, more days per week. And you can see that particular uh, set of columns sticking way up there. Uh, the next set of things were pretty close in terms of uh, a second tier, but those things are open more hours per day, um, more cozy spaces, um, author and literacy events, more film music events, those kinds of things. And you can spend a little bit more time looking at these individually, but, but these are the kind of things that people would like to see more of in the future. Next slide, please. We looked at uh, the various millage options, and one of the things that we asked is whether people uh, would select which, which options they would select in terms of the best arguments in favor of the millage. And we broke this apart by whether folks said that they would be in favor of it overall or against the millage, just to get a sense for how that, um, which arguments resonate the most. And so in terms of the best arguments in favor of the millage, you can see the number one thing is to keep public Troy Library open. 50% uh, of the folks said that's the very strong argument. Um, the second argument that was the most powerful is protects the ability to deliver services and programs. And number three was really to modernize Troy Public Library to meet the needs of residents. Next slide. Best arguments against the millage. Number one, people don't want higher taxes. Um, that is what's considered the most important argument. Uh, number two is that they don't use the library. And number three is that the building these community needs. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So then looking at the individual millage uh, questions to see which ones are supported and which ones are not. Uh, the first option was to not continue the millage and eliminate the library. And we can see that only about 7% uh, of the respondents supported that particular option. Uh, far and away, you know, almost 80% of the respondents um, opposed the idea of eliminating the library. Next slide, please. So the next option was to provide minimal funding, which is about 0.9 mils. And we looked at the number of folks who would support that or oppose that. And you can see uh, on the far left-hand side that approximately 43% of the respondents support that particular option. And there's quite a bit of opposition there, about 32% or so, the number of people that are on the fence that need more information. So let's go to the next slide. So here we go up uh, uh, 
to a little bit more of a funding level. So this is one mil to provide um, increased library hours and go from six days a week to seven. And you can see that the support for that then jumps above the 50% mark and the opposition drops down a little bit to about 22%, which is consistent with the comment earlier in the meeting tonight. And there's still a number of folks who are undecided that would like to have more information, about 20%. Uh, next slide, please. So the next option is looking at uh, a higher funding level. This is 1.1 mils. And we can see the support level starts to dip down a little bit, so a little bit below the 50%. But again, with this slide and the last one, I'd like to remind you that you've got a margin of error of just about 5%. We want to keep that in mind. Uh, the opposition, again, is about 20%. And you have about 23% uh, of folks who could go either way. They would like to have more information. They're undecided. Next slide, please. We wanted to, to ask folks, if the election were held today, would they support uh, whatever millage uh, option they selected? And you can see that well over 70% of folks said that they would support uh, the millage, and only about 10% said that they would oppose the millage. And you still have about 15% who are not sure undecided. Next slide. We had a couple of open-ended questions. Uh, the comments are available. Uh, I believe that staff have it, you may have it already. Uh, there were about 50 pages of comments. Um, so this particular slide is designed to really give you a sense of what were included in those comments by theme. So the words that came up most often are the largest words in that word cloud. And then we use those words to then pull out the themes uh, and the supporting uh, verbatims associated with them. So you can see community being right there in the middle. And the kind of comments there were that a library is key to a thriving educated community, that a library is crucial to a community like Troy, uh, and that it attracts residents to the community. The word value was a large word as well, uh, that the library and the condition of programs of the library really reflects the values of the residents of the city of Troy. Of Troy. Um, that the city there, that the library itself is valued by residents. Uh, and then you had some folks who had concerns that the cost of the millage is higher than the value provided to them. Um, so that's, that's some of the other voice, the other concerns that are coming through uh, that you'll want to think about. The word service, another large word right there at the top. Uh, they consider the library to be a, really a staple basic service that communities need to provide. Uh, the library makes uh, community desirable and they talk about the kids. Lots of examples of the kids loving the library and experiences that, that they have. Next slide, please. We also had a comment uh, opportunity uh, just to guide your consideration as we go into it. So the word fund came up quite a bit and the comments were really themed around paying for the library through the general fund and existing funds instead of doing something special from a funding standpoint. Um, another set of themes around the word fund where that funding improvements should be tied uh, to important improvements, so specific funding for specific improvements. And then a number of folks saying, you know, this is just a really important thing, we need to fully fund the library. The word open came up a lot, and this is really focused on being open seven days per week. That's something that had a lot of value for a lot of respondents. Um, and if it's not open seven days, they wanted to make sure that the library was open on Fridays. So that's another thing that came up pretty often. The word keep, another large word. So they want to at least keep current services at a, as a bare minimum. They want uh, council and city staff to keep residents informed of what's going on with this issue because it's very important to them. Uh, and they do want to modernize the library to keep up with resident needs and to make sure that this library continues to provide the value that people would, would like to have from it. Next slide, please. So that concludes the quick run through the, the high level data. Are there questions that I can answer for you? Thank you, William. Uh, any questions from council for William? It's a very uh, thorough research. I really appreciate it. I mean, and to see the cross tabs that were sent to us and to, to actually be able to dig into all this information was very, very uh, informative and helpful for my decision-making process. And I appreciate all the work Cobalt has done. And William, you've done presenting last week and tonight. Um, so very, very good. So. so uh, any questions from council at this point? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Hamilton. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for all your hard work, William, and everyone else who contributed to this, Bob Bruner and 
Mark Miller. Um, my question is, there was the one question that said, would you support this millage that showed 90% support? Um, how did that differ from the questions that asked each individual millage? And how can how should we interpret that question? That one was interesting to me because it was a little different than the other. Sure. And I think part of it ties in with the theme of the, the comment earlier in the night that some people um, didn't vote for every option. But when we asked if they would support for uh, support for the option that they chose, then they said yes. So you don't have people voting for when they selected which millage option they supported. They didn't all su support all of the options. But when we have a question about do they would they support the option that they selected, then that's why we have that higher percentage of uh, 77 percent. Okay. Additional questions? Council Member Chamberlain Kranger. Thank you, Mayor. And um, I was going to ask a similar question to that as well. And William, again, thank you so much for all of this great data you're giving us. And thank you for city management who, who made, made it all possible. Um, the other question that I had remaining was I was diving into the cost tabs, was paying attention to, um, to, uh, to age and, and kind of generation and just wondering how, you know, how along the lines of, of generation do we see use of the library and support? And from what I saw is across all the various age groups, there seemed to be pretty consistent in terms of how people are using the library and in terms of that support. So just wanted to get your confirmation, William, is that, um, would that be a good assessment of it? Um, Cause it was something I, I was expecting to be a little bit different. And so it was good to kind of see how that was playing out around, especially some, some of the, um, the key areas I was looking at it. It, it is. And part of it is you think about the older generations, they're bringing in the grandkids. And so you have some of the smoothing that goes on just based on the, the characteristics of the household and who the folks are that are coming to the library. That's great. The reason why I asked that question is, as I've talked to residents, I have heard from some folks who are seniors who say they're not using it any longer and, and you know had some questions about about the library and mm -hmm. we're trying to understand the village. And so it's good to see the data overall is that actually seniors are very engaged with the library according to that data. Um, so that was helpful to, to see that. Thank you. Thank you. And Bob, our assistant city manager, Bernie. Yeah, I just want to add anecdotally from the focus groups, we heard from, uh, you know, people who weren't seniors who assumed that seniors didn't use the library, like the operating assumption was like the libraries for kids. And it's not just for kids that we heard from seniors who um, uh, use the, the the library a lot uh, as well. So um, anecdotally, we heard from uh, folks in the focus groups very similar to what the data shows. Very good. More questions for William. Okay. Uh, Bob, back to you, I guess. Thank yeah, you, thanks. What? Well, we'll bring up the second presentation, please. <laughs> The suspense is killing me. <laughs> yeah, we're almost there. <laughs> okay, so um, all right, I'll talk. 
uh, we can see it. It's not in, in full screen view, but um, in the interest of time. Um, so this this presentation is is organized a little bit differently uh, than the uh, past presentations. I think maybe this is the third one I've delivered since um, uh, since June. Um, and uh, so it, it's organized in terms of talking about uh, library past, present, and future. Okay, go ahead to the next slide and the next one. And then we're going to wrap up and talk about the next steps. So next slide, please. So um, I looked over library expenditures for 15 year period from the fiscal year that ended in 2006 to um, the one that ended just this year. And I looked at library expenditures and uh, adjusted them for inflation using uh, the Headley uh, the, the same inflation rate multiplier used in the Headley millage reduction fraction formula. Um, so we're going to get really deep into uh, property values here tonight. Um, not really. But uh, so I'm going to show you a chart in a minute that shows that real library spending uh, peaked in the fiscal year that ended 2006. That was peak library when you adjust everything to $2,020, because obviously a, a $2,006 bought more stuff than a $2,020 buys. And uh, uh, so we adjust them for inflation. Those are real dollars. Nominal dollars are just regular, not adjusted for inflation. And uh, in terms of just nominal dollars, library spending peaked. I'm actually three years later in the fiscal year that ended 2009. So a little bit uh, interesting to see these patterns. But first, I have a brief digression about Headley rollbacks and inflation because uh, the Headley rollback is, has been something that's come up frequently. Uh, next slide, please. So a little background from the Michigan, Michigan Municipal League. Um, the term Headley rollback has been part of local government finance actually since 1978, which is when the so-called Headley Amendment to the Michigan Constitution was, was passed. Now the Headley Amendment itself um, didn't cause the kinds of problems that we uh, uh, have experienced more recently since the passage of Proposal A in 1994. And so sometimes Proposal A and Headley work together um, in, in, in ways that are uh, interesting. I'll leave it at that. So, but just talking about Headley, in a nutshell, it requires uh, the millage rate to, to be reduced when the annual growth on existing property is greater than inflation. So if the uh, property values go up gr faster, greater than inflation, then the millage rate's got to go down so that the yield of tax dollars uh, only goes up by the rate of inflation. And so that's uh, the consequential Headley rollback when that millage rate gets rolled back. So um, go ahead, um, next slide, please. Uh, rollbacks occur based on that Headley calculation. That calculation is called the millage reduction fraction. And the formula for calculating uh, that millage reduction fraction includes an inflation rate multiplier. Every year, that inflation rate multiplier gets calculated. And that calculation is set by state statute. You don't get to do your own local uh, inflation rate calculation. The Michigan Department of Treasury performs that statutory calculation and publishes the results every year. And they also publish every inflation rate uh, calculation or, or every uh, inflation rate multiplier uh, back to 1995. 
when Proposal A started. So it's real easy to go back and, and look what was the inflation rate multiplier for every year back to, 2000, or, uh, to 1995. And so I just used those numbers to adjust um, those uh, 2006, 7, et cetera, dollars into 2020 dollars. Next slide, please. So this is a uh, library materials. This is the collection budget and um, it's uh, stated in millions. So you can see the, um, the orange line is uh, the inflation adjusted and you can see the peak materials budget was back in the fiscal year that ended 2006. Um, you're gonna see that huge divot in the fiscal year that ended um, in 2011 which was the time that the library was actually uh, preparing to close. Um, so this is just the materials budget portion of, of the library. So you can see how you know, it uh, uh, has basically been steadily declining over the last 15 years, kind of leveled off here uh, more recently. Next slide, please. And, and uh, to not to literally back up, but to, I, I uh, pulled out the collection budget specifically because it's one of the larger parts of the library budget. And it's also something that we heard a lot about during the focus groups. It's very important to um, uh, folks that we have a robust uh, collection. So library staffing is the biggest part of the budget um, and the one that we heard the most about in the focus groups and uh, the survey. Uh, we heard that people want seven day service again. So again, you see we had um, peak library staffing back in the fiscal year that ended in uh, 2006. And then um, you see how it basically kind of crashed there in 2011 when the library was preparing for closure. But unlike the collection budget, it didn't jump back up. It is slowly crawled uh, up a little bit. Um, but the library staffing budget, even, you know, when you, uh, whether it's adjusted for inflation or, or not, it, it's what you call an L-shaped recovery uh, in terms of uh, uh, library staffing. So next slide, please. Now, this is total library expenditures, the, the whole enchilada, like I said, um, uh, in real dollars, peak library was fiscal year that ended 2006. Nominal dollars, fiscal year that ended 2009. Um, you can see uh, fell in the hole in 2011 when the library was preparing for closure. And uh, overall expenditures um, have uh, uh, crept up since then. But obviously, we're you know, nowhere near uh, pre-recession levels. Next slide, please. So, um, just want to talk briefly about the library as it is today. Next slide. So um, this is information we've talked about before. Currently, uh, the library millage does not cover the full cost of operating the library. Um, long story short, when uh, the library millage was first passed and uh, expenditures um, were still depressed, the library fund balance uh, was built up and then we've subsequently been spending that fund balance down. So we've been uh, basically, you know, using the savings account or the rainy day fund to help pay for library uh, operations. And that fund balance is going to be spent down to, to close to zero this year. So that's not sustainable. Next slide, please. Same thing's true for maintenance of the library. Um, current millage doesn't cover the full cost of maintaining the library. Uh, one, for the same reason this, that's true for operations, is true for maintenance, but even more specifically, um, as has been mentioned before, the capital projects fund uh, funded approximately $1.2 million for renovations and roof uh, replacement in the fiscal year that just ended. Next slide. So tonight, City Council gets uh, to talk about what do we want the library to look like in the future? Next slide. Uh, so this, you've seen this graphic uh, or before, uh, it, it's been updated, um, but this is the library's hierarchy of needs. And uh, tweaked this a little bit since the last time you saw it. And I put financial security 
um, as as the and the initial uh, ver the last version of this triangle you saw, I had um, building maintenance and uh, library fund balance and library maintenance were, were uh, on the the bottom and kind of the the foundation of the of the pyramid, um, you know. But we heard a lot from people both through the focus groups and the surveys that having a financially secure library was was really important. Um, so I really felt like that um, was really kind of the, the foundation for the library's hi hierarchy of, of needs. Building maintenance, uh, still very important um, and, and a close second. Um, no building, no library. Um, library materials, which is the collection. Again, we heard about that in the focus groups as being very important. Um, seven day service being the most uh, uh, popular item in the uh, uh, the survey and then building upgrades also being uh, very important. Um, so this is kind of the, the, the hierarchy uh, that um, city, can, city council can use to, to guide your decision making. Next slide, please. So on this slide, I took the um, library expenditures um, that, that you already saw, and then I added what if the millage rate uh, next year was 0 0.9, 1.0, 1.1, .1, which are the three options that we've been uh, talking about. And then when I created that chart, I realized it, I, I led me to the question, like, well, what would it take to get us back to peak library in, uh, in real dollars? And it happens to be 1.2 mils. So I, I've added that onto this chart for illustrative purposes that it, uh, we'd, we'd need to levy 1.2 mils to get us to $6.1 million, which um, peak library back in fiscal year ended uh, 2006 was $6 million when adjusted for inflation. So um, all of these options, uh, you know, are, are, are Basically, none of these options are, are going to take library spending and, and um, like put it up in the stratosphere inconsistent with uh, what it was historically before the recession. Next slide, please. So this is a, a little greater detail of the different options. And, and again, you've, you've seen these before, um, the uh, nine tenths millage, what it, the revenue it generates and how it would be spent, um, the the one mill option and how it would be spent. Um, I won't pause on these too long because um, we have a different way to present this information that I think uh, will be a little more helpful. So go ahead to the next slide. Again, 1.1 and then uh, just adding that 1.2 mill option for consistency so you can kind of see uh, mm -hmm. uh, potentially how these funds could be uh, spent. Um, next slide, please. Um, so in the uh, library building maintenance of the future, we know that the uh, facility condition assessment reports includes $1.3 million in capital needs um, in, the, in the coming years. A uh, big majority of that is for total replacement of the HVAC system um, the HVAC system is uh, original, 1986. Um, that's a major building system, accounts for a lot of that. And so the library millage rate and duration that the city council decides to put on the ballot and the voters de uh, decide to approve will determine how much maintenance and how many upgrades uh, to the library can be made. Next slide. So this is uh, the wish list, <laughs> um, not the complete wish list, um, but these are, some, uh, I talked to Kathy about this, uh, Kathy helped generate this list of, um, you know, if we had more money for upgrades, how would we spend it? New furniture, I think is the top of the list for reasons we've discussed before. Um, some of it's been uh, reupholstered, uh, but, uh, 
a lot of it is, you know, original equipment from 1971, 1986. New study spaces, most frequently requested new amenity. Um, you heard William talk about uh, cozy spaces was uh, the way it came across on, on the survey. Um, talked about a new dedicated teen area, a new maker space and technology area, renovating the youth services area, actually um, renovating the circulation area, uh, which would free up lobby space. We have a big circulation desk um, there uh, that could be reconfigured. And then the administration area is in real need of renovation in order to add office space for additional staff in order to support the seven day service, which was the uh, number one requested uh, uh, upgrade. So in that case, your uh, kind of op the uh, operational costs are, are of uh, supporting that seven day service also contribute to building costs. Next slide, please. So this uh, slide helps illustrate um, how much money could be generated by each one of these options for upgrades. So um, option A, for example, nine tenths of a mil generate uh, $4 million if uh, the library of millage was approved for an eight year term and $5 million uh, for a 10 year term. And then you look all the way up to um, the uh, 1.2 mil option would generate twice that much. So um, I don't think we'd have a very hard time spending eight or $10 million to upgrade uh, the building over the course of the uh, next uh, eight or 10 years. Um, it's just a matter of, uh, you know, how much money uh, the, the voters are willing to support and for how long. Next slide, please. So this is a, a table I referred to a little earlier, which, which I think helps kind of compare these different options side by side. So um, got nine tenths of a mil, one mil, 1.1 and 1.2. And top, uh, you see how much library fund revenue is, is generated um, by each of those millages. And so then the next thing is hours because that's the, the number one most requested thing. So you see with the the uh, the nine tenths of a mil option that was really t designed basically to maintain the status quo doesn't allow us to increase hours doesn't really uh, allow us to um, provide any upgrades uh, just maintain the building uh, the way it needs to be uh, maintained and so um, based on the average taxable value of one hundred thirty thousand dollars that would cost the average residential taxpayer uh, $9.75. So the next option, the one mill option, you see here the additional, uh, the difference between option A and option B is that now you got that seven day service, um, bumping up uh, the uh, personnel expenses from 2.5 million to, to 3 million, but still the half million dollars for um, library upgrades, which doesn't really pay for many upgrades. That's mostly just maintenance. Remember I said we have spent on average about $300,000 a year on maintenance and there's more maintenance that needs to be uh, done. Um, so the, the cost of that seven day service with uh, everything else basically remaining the same bumps that uh, monthly average residential cost up to $10.83. The 1.1 mil option, you've still got the seven day service there. Now you're generating more revenue for more building upgrades and potentially bumping up the collection budget. Um, now the city council can divvy up that money uh, uh, any way you want. We could put more into the building um, and, and keep the collection uh, budget consistent uh, with what it is now, but at the 1.1 mil option, um, now you've got you've got some some options in in, uh, in terms of how you want to invest the money in the in the library, and then the um, the option D um, you got building upgrades all the way up to at a, a million dollars a year with the collection, 
at um, $800,000 a year, increasing computer services, which technology was another huge thing um, that we heard about in the, in the focus groups. And even at that level, the average residential taxpayer is going to pay um, $13 a month, which um, has been pointed out. Uh, I pay more than that for my Netflix subscription, but I have more than one screen. I don't have the minimum Netflix. I think minimum Netflix might be less expensive than $13 a month. But that was another thing we heard in the focus groups is that, oh, golly, even with, you know, all these options, I'm, I'm spending more on streaming services and similar things like that. Next slide, please. So a couple of considerations to keep in mind. Um, first is current millage not sustainable. Uh, in order to sustain current operations and, and keep the building up, it's nine tenths of a mil minimum. Um, on the other end, or the other side of the coin, uh, the, live, uh, the city council may levy less than the maximum millage rate approved by voters. So what you're asking, what ultimately the ballot uh, question will ask voters is to give to authorize the minimum of whatever millage rate uh, you choose. But if um, you know there are other considerations that you would want to levy a, a lower millage rate, that's uh, completely up to the city council to do that during, and to adopt that millage rate during the budget process. Next slide, please. All right, next steps, next slide. The public engagement is over. Um, so those bullet points have turned to check marks. We've, we've done the survey, we've done the, the, the focus groups. And so now the next steps for city council are to determine uh, the millage rate and the duration to be presented to the voters uh, on the November ballot. Now, the next regular city council meeting is on Monday, August 10th, and the very next day, Tuesday, August 11th, is the deadline to approve ballot wording. So city staff needs some uh, direction uh, tonight on, on how you want to proceed in order for us to have that ballot language prepared uh, at the next regular meeting. Um, so that concludes my presentation, and I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions you might have. Okay. All right. Well, first, I have to say, Bob, public engagement is never over. So although your formal public engagement process may be over, public engagement is never over. We're always open to hear from the citizens and we'll continue to hear and listen to the feedback of the residents all the way up until we vote on this and once we move past it as well. So that's the head start with that. But I, my, what I wanted to start with was thank you for a very good and thorough presentation. Again, you've given us the June 8th presentation was fantastic. Last week was great. Tonight was taking everything and putting it together with those slides and the graphics really um, made it clear to see, although it's tiny on my screen, I had, you'd sent a lot of that information to us before and we were able to review it. I, I really do appreciate, Bob, what you've done to really take a hold of this ship and go through this process. We talked a lot about the public engagement process as you did. Um, and how they were so successful with the virtual that we can consider keeping those for future items as well. So thank you, Bob. Uh, thank you, Mark, obviously, for and all of city management. Kathy Russ, I know you, as always, play a huge role in all, all things library for good reason. So thank you for the work you've put in and all the blood, sweat, and tears over the past several weeks and months as we've prepared for where we're heading tonight, which is... Um, trying to give some direction to city management as to what ballot language should be at our next meeting so we can approve to put it on um, the November ballot. So with that, I, I think it's best, um, I, know, I don't know how all of you have organized things. I have some questions in my mind and in my notes first. I wanna start with questions before we move more to comments and um, advocacy, I guess, if that's possible. Obviously, I can't control that and you're free to say whatever it is <laughs> you wanna say, but if we could stick to the questions first, I think that might help. Um, so I'll start with questions uh, that you may have for Bob or Kathy or anyone else. Uh, Councilmember Abraham. Thank you, Mayor. Um, City Manager, uh, Assistant City Manager uh, Bruner, I, I did have a question for you about slide 20 of your presentation where you were showing the four different options and 
the, the funding that would be established under each on an annual basis, whether it was eight years or 10 years. Um, my question is, it looked like option A, which was 0.9 mils, and option B, which was one mil, generated the same amount of funding. Is, is that correct? I would have expected um, option B to be higher than option A. Yeah, let me take a look at that right quick. Um, oh, yeah. The, so the, the way the information was presented on um, slide 20, uh, they are the same. And the difference there being that option A is maintenance of the status quo, and option B was the addition of seven-day service. So there's no change in uh, the amount of money available for upgrades, building upgrades specifically between option A and option B. And that's why I said that that uh, uh, the next slide, option uh, slide 21 that had all four of them laid out in the table um, was a, a little more clear. Um, but that slide 20 was just focused specifically on building upgrades. I appreciate that clarification because I know the, the value for what um, citizens are going to be paying in terms of the millage. They were looking for transparency. They want to know that they're getting their money's worth. And I think that explanation helps clarify slide 20. So thank you. That was the only question I had. And I also wanted to mention um, before we get too deep into this, that um, all the information uh, or much of the information, all the information that William has provided um, has already been posted on the city website and the city council meeting archive um, uh, under late submittals. So uh, for the folks at home, you can d download the, the study comments, all 50 pages that, that William talked about, the cross tabs, um, the summary uh, presentation that, that he gave uh, tonight. And uh, he, he finished his presentation uh, last Thursday afternoon. I didn't finish mine until this morning. So my, mine will be posted later, but um, coming to a web page near you very soon is all this information. So, uh, because you're right, it's uh, very difficult to see on a screen in this format. Before I get to you, Mayor Pertem Hamilton, uh, Kathy, I saw you put your hand up for a second. I didn't know if you, okay, just making sure. Maybe you were adjusting something. Uh, Mayor Pertem Hamilton. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so let's, let's say that whatever, uh, voters vote yes on this on November 3rd and it passes. Do we, and, and I know that the, the, the new millage rate would not be, would, would, would not be levied until the two, summer 2021 uh, property tax uh, levy. Do we kind of have any idea of when the library would open for seven days or when we would start to be able to do some of these upgrades? Assuming we did we chose one of the, the, the voters chose one of the higher level options. I know that, that the budget for this isn't for the fiscal year 2022 budget, but knowing that the millage was coming, would we have to wait till July 1st, 2021, or would we start, could this process be started earlier? That's City Manager Miller, I saw your hand go up. Mayor and Council, um, I just want to start this out that um, Assistant City Manager Bruner and Public, uh, Library Director Russ and I really haven't talked about this. However, if they have any thoughts, they can they can talk freely. Well, I'll I'll chime in then. So, and this is actually can get really confusing um, when we're talking about years because the property tax bill that folks pay in July next year, 2021, is revenue for the city in the fiscal year that ends in 2022. Uh, so, um, you know, if voters were to approve a millage in November 2020 and the city council, you know, wanted to pre-spend some of that money uh, before the next fiscal year, um, uh, yeah, that can be done. That that money's got to come from somewhere through a, a, a budget amendment or, or that sort of thing. Um, so uh, not completely out of the question, but that would be a, a kind of a de separate conversation. Yeah, it seems like the, the staffing up process might have to start a little early 
if we we get it done by July first. But it'll be that'll be a discussion. You know, depending on what the voters choose, it'll be an exciting discussion of how we implement these changes. But um, I, I was just curious because it just randomly came in my head, like what what would be the timeline for this? So I know November is four months into this fiscal year, so there's still be another eight months till the new fiscal year started with with the new budget. So it'll be an interesting discussion, but I guess that's something for council and city staff to figure out, to, depending on what the voters decide. And and ultimately, this is the voters' decision. All we're doing is presenting the voters with an option. That's what we're trying to figure out here based on the polling, based on what we've heard from residents. In the end, it's out of our hands. It's up, it's up to the voters. It's up to the residents. And we'll try to follow their vision the best we can. Kathy, I saw you again. Raise your hand a little bit on that one. Is that, <laughs> did you want to add anything, or was it well covered? Thank you, Mayor. Um, actually, Councilmember Hamilton answered the question, but I would just need some time to hire people to to staff the seven days. So. Uh, more questions? Uh, Councilmember Chamberlain Kranga. Thank you, Mayor. Just to clarify, um, Assistant City Manager Bruner, is the 1.2 millage option, the millage rate, was that asked in the focus groups? I know we did not ask it in the survey. No, it, it, it we haven't done any research on that. Um, like I said, the reason that came to mind is when I was preparing that that chart specifically that showed uh, historically, you know, what uh, spending was uh, after adjusting for inflation. It just happened to come out that you know 1.2 mil would put us back at that peak, but we we didn't do any uh, uh, research on that question. Thank you. Just wanted to clarify if anyone was listening. Um, the second question is going back to William, if I can circle back to him and just want to go back again to the residents and their um, what they provided to us and their thoughts. Um, so the question I tried raising in the, um, the study session and we needed William for it was looking at when voters were asked about supporting the, the millage rate of one, one mil or 1.1 mil, you had for one mil just above 50% and for the 1.1 mil, you had just kind of under 50%. And I know that people typically, um, they answered every question. They weren't choosing one or the other. And so just trying to ask if you could help us understand like how how close or how um, far apart are those, is that differential between those, um, those options? It's within the margin of error. Okay. Um, okay, sort of helps just trying to understand, and I'm trying to go back to those two options as well in terms of the people who opposed and those who are undecided and try to understand, um, I don't have this slide, I can pull it up, up on my own computer, but because um, to me, those are where residents sort of, um, you saw a, a um, where there was a lot of support were around those various options. So just trying to weigh kind of between those those two. So if there's anything else you can give us to help us understand what people were, were maybe thinking, or if there's anything from our focus groups um, that could help us as well, that would be useful. Just want to throw it out there. If there's not, there's not, but. Uh, Assistant City Manager Bruner. Thanks. Uh, well, while, while William's looking at that, I'll add that um, I think the, the undecideds make the difference in in every case uh in, in every option there's enough uh uh there, there's enough undecided folks um to make the difference um uh and we heard from the focus groups you know in, in the in the, the the people who are undecided were saying i want more information in the focus groups i presented them some information about here's where troy uh compares to other communities and uh, you know here's how much it would cost on a on a monthly basis and so when presented with additional uh, information people supported it now those folks in the focus group were not random sample um, and were uh, you know pretty supportive of the library overall but so were the survey respondents so, um, you know, when I look, when William was presenting just earlier and I was looking at those charts, I'm already thinking ahead to the next phase in this, which is the public education. Once the city council picks a millage rate and a duration, 
uh, then we have to start to provide information to the community. And that's going to, uh, uh, you know, potentially really make a big difference. I would agree with what Bob said. The, uh, if you look at the two slides and you have a chance to look at that, you will see the number of undecided jump quite a bit when you go from the one option that had like the 52% support to the, the one that was just a little bit below. And I think it ties in with the uh, comments within the survey where folks said that they really want to understand what are the specific improvements. If we're going to improve the funding, what are the improvements to the library? We want to make sure that they're, they're paying for something specific and that they're seeing that value increase for whatever it is uh, that you're looking at doing. So I think it just depends on uh, which particular set of improvements you want to make to the library to go along with whatever funding is appropriate to support that. That's helpful. Thank you both. And it was great to combine the quantitative with the qualitative focus groups. Additional questions? Uh, Councilmember Erickson Gall. Yes, uh, this is a question probably directed at City Attorney uh, Bloom. Um, along the lines of people wanting to know where, where the money's going, uh, would we be able to put out theoretically neutral information that would sort of show where the money is, where we anticipate the money would be going? Or would that be problematic because it's not written in stone where the money's going? I guess I'm just trying to get a sense of how well that once we decide on ballot language, what can we tell the public in terms of where the money's going? So um, as long as it is factually, um, new, it is factual and it's neutral, does not take a position one way or the other, that is something that you could include. And I think that um, the uh, importance of it is that you will have a chance to decide what the levy will be. So if the voters approve the ballot question, it'll be a levy of up to a certain amount. And so you, um, you know, will, will probably have provide greater detail as to what you intend to spend that money on each year as, the, as you determine what that millage rate will be. So I think it's it's okay to do that. Obviously, we cannot commit that it will be spent that way unless the ballot language is crafted in that manner. And I would not advise that you do that. Sure. So, so we have to be careful in terms of, for instance, we talked about maybe sending out a mailer or using social media to spread that content neutral information to the public so we'd have to be careful not to make any promises about where the money is going is kind of what i'm hearing from you is that about accurate yes i, I do not recommend that you um are are so restrictive um in the ballot language that it can only be used for um in, you know set purposes because we just don't know what the future will hold especially if it goes out 10 years That was my only question. Additional questions? I have a couple, no one else does. Um, and mine are, full disclosure, my questions are kind of all over the map, but they all are about the library, so I'll give you that at least. How about, how about that? Um, so, but in no particular order. My first question is, uh, I think it's for Bob. Um, these funding, the various funding levels that you're showing does that include, and I can't remember, what you've typically called the icing on the cake, which are the other funds the library collects? Are those all inclusive in that, or is that just the property tax dollars? Just the property tax revenue. Okay, so there will still be some icing also. Fingers crossed. A lot of that icing is my point. No, I mean, it's, it's okay. Okay. That, that's, that's my first question. I just wanted to make sure about that. Um, is... This one's for Kathy, I think. Kathy, um, have there been complaints about our collection and the value of what the, the money we're spending on our collection or resources, uh, collection resources that we don't have? Or I, I've not really been made aware over the years that people concerned about us having a lack of materials 
Um, I know what they are as far as the numbers, and we've looked at those, but I, I wasn't aware of specific complaints or issues with our residents having concerns. I wonder if you could elaborate on that at all. Sure. Um, I would say that we, we, to be frank, we don't get a lot of complaints about the library's collection in terms of what it doesn't have. We're also very fortunate that um, we take part in MELCAT, which is the statewide interlibrary loan system. So we can always order materials from other libraries around the state. Um, that said, when we have discontinued certain databases, such as Morningstar or any of the financial ones due to cost, um, there's always some um, unhappy people about that. And then the other thing, and this is a perennial issue, um, the holds list. So, you know, if we order 10 copies of a book and there are 300 holds, it takes a while for people to go through the holds list and get the and get the book that they're waiting for, their audio book. And that holds true for ebooks as well. Um, ebooks don't have an unlimited circulation. So if you place a hold on an ebook, we ha might have to wait. You might have to wait till I was finished with it. It's not an unlimited number of licenses. So, um, but I, you know, I would say that that's probably the, the tends to be the tenor of the complaints that I get. Okay. Um, couple of my other questions have kind of been answered. So I, I'll go to, um, this is a city manager Miller or city attorney Blue. And I, tonight from us, do you need a formal resolution um, asking that you provide us with ballot language for the next uh, meeting to approve? Do you need, or just consensus from us to have direction? What is your preferred method this evening, uh, city attorney Blue? I think if we have consensus that will allow us to bring back the resolution, you'll obviously need to vote at the next meeting on whatever the language is. Okay. So recognizing that fellow council members, <laughs> we need consensus on um, ideally a, um, a rate and a duration this evening. And um, who wants to start? How about that? I mean, it's, uh, I had a feeling it would be Mayor Pro Tem Hamilton. <laughs> uh, thank, thank you, Mayor. Mayor. Um, Go ahead. Oh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, this is something I, I've, I've thought about my entire time on council. Um, I've used this library. I was probably going in there as an infant with my mom in 1983. Um, so this is probably the, the thing I'm most passionate about when it comes to our city. Um, when we look at the past of the library and that during the peak of the recession, we were down to half of what the inflation adjusted spending was before in 2006. And right now we're at two thirds of what the inflation adjusted spending was in 2006. And that this library for the last 10 years has been running on a shoestring budget. There's no denying that. And I think given the fact that our millage rate is dropping 1.0605 as i said before no matter what we do we really and, and it dropped 0.2 the previous year because of 0.25 the previous year because of more debt being paid off and because of headly adjustments that it's a unique opportunity to really restore our library to what it once was and we're getting clear direction from our residents from the polling we see support versus oppose for 1.1 was I think 20, 30 points uh, towards support. And then there were undecideds, but I mean, it doesn't take a lot of those undecideds to really come home. So for me, first of all, uh, with the five-year millages we previously had, I, I am entirely convinced we need a 10-year millage. That is the option we need to present to our voters. To me, I really have no doubt on that, that that's where we go. We see this is what other communities do. Most other communities do. And to me, that's a no-brainer. What I'm debating is the final millage rate. I, I think it needs to be at least one. I mean, it, one mill would still lower the overall tax rate uh, based on the debt millage and the library millage falling off. To me, the question is, do we go one, 1.1, 1 1.2? 1 uh, I think coming into this meeting, I was, after seeing those survey results, I'm thinking 1.1 1 .1 is probably uh, the best option. It effectively maintains the same millage rate we had before with heavily possible heavily adjustments. We could be looking at the same millage rate. If there's any cost more, it might be 40 cents a month. I think 1.0605 is dropping off. If we do 1.1, 1 .1, we're, we're talking a fraction of a dollar of a month. And that would really 
almost completely restore our library to what it once was. It would give us seven days, expand our collection, be able to really rebuild the 30, 50 year old building. Um, to me, that's where I'm at right now. 1.1 for 10 years. I never really thought about the 1.2 option until it was presented tonight. Um, I, because we haven't gotten any polling on that, uh, I'm not quite sure on that, but I'm looking at what residents are telling me and 1.1 for 10 years seems like the optimal, it seems like what residents are telling us what they want. So that's where I'm at right now. I don't know where everyone else is at, but that's kind of my thoughts at the moment. Very good. That's funny you should say that. I literally have no idea where everyone else is at on this. I mean, we're obviously prohibited from talking yeah. and making decisions behind closed doors, but that I, I'm looking at all these faces thinking, I can't read any of you and I don't know where, <laughs> I could have guessed, actually Mayor Pro Tem Hamilton, I probably could have guessed where you were gonna come out. So I, <laughs> you're the easiest for me, but the rest of you, I, I really don't know. So I'm, I'm very curious and intrigued that we go. Um, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Hamilton, for starting off the conversation with that. I think I know that you bring a, a fine eye to the Excel spreadsheets and you've done a lot of work looking at this, so I appreciate that. Um, anyone else like to weigh in at this point? Uh, Mayor, uh, <laughs> Council Member Erickson Dahl. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I I agree with Council Member or Mayor Pro Tem Hamilton that uh, the ten years is a no brainer. I think we heard that very clearly in our uh, focus group discussion. I believe it was where they said they were feeling a bit of millage fatigue. That this question keeps coming at them again and again. A ten year millage would uh, mean that the voters wouldn't have to think about what the millage would be for 10 years and which would be definitely a relief, I think, to some of them. Um, I, I'm leaning towards 1.1 with the understanding that that gives us the ability to levy up to 1.1 if we hear as you mentioned earlier, Mayor Baker, the public engagement never ends. And if we hear the public telling us that 1.1 is a little on the high side, then we have that option to actually levy less than 1.1. Uh, but 1.1 had very strong support in the survey. Um, as Mayor Pro Tem Hamilton pointed out, it was nearly 50% even if you cut the undecideds in half, the 1.1 1 .1 would clearly pass. Um, you, it, it, it gives us options and it gives us a library that I think our residents want. Our residents want a library that they can be proud of. Uh, they want a library that is fully functional. Um, so I am my inclination would be to go 10 years and 1.1. Thank you. Um, Council Member Hoderick. I'm in agreement on the 10 years. I am struggling um, between one and 1.1. 1 .1. And partly I think with COVID and some of the financial hits that we know our friends and neighbors are taking, um, the up to 1.1 makes sense to us because we know if we do have a sense the community needs us to, to pull it back to one and maybe forego some new furniture that year or whatnot, that we would do that. But I don't know that the community understands that. And that's where I'm, um, I'm struggling a bit. I think if we can say, um, and we had this discussion at the study session, maybe we can repeat this again um, for anyone watching fresh and even just to refresh our memories. Um, with the expiration of the debt millage and the millage reduction that we did before that uh, Mayor Pro Tem Hamilton um, keeps reminding us of because he has his spreadsheets probably right there in front of him. Um, you know, some folks like my husband and I, we're, we're looking to make sure we are as fiscally responsible in our home as we are to the city. Um, how can we assure people that we aren't um, talking it to them at a hard time? We can be able to explain that, that if we pass the one mill, it's a, you know, 
it's a net, I think it was even a decrease. If we go back, um, it, it took us back a few years. So I don't know if maybe we could talk that through. I see um, assistant manager Bruner. I'd love you to weigh in and help us. Yeah, I'm going to put IT on the spot and see if they can bring up Exhibit 2, which um, uh, City Council knows uh, I sent out some supplemental information um, late this afternoon uh, so, with some questions and answers from the city manager's office as, as well as a, a brief memo from me and, and a few charts that I didn't think really would show up on the screen very well. Um, but in that uh, supplemental information file, uh, if we can see exhibit two, next slide, next page. Oh, not that far. <laughs> yeah, there it is. So this is the total city millage rate beginning in the fiscal year that ended 2011. That was the last year before the dedicated library millage kicked in. And so the millage rate was the city's total millage rate was 9.4 mils. Uh, next year, you got seven tenths of a mil uh, in a new dedicated library millage. So in the fiscal year that ended 2012, that kicked it up to uh, 10.19. There's a little, there's some changes in some other millage rates there. So it's not exactly a 0.7 change. Um, but then uh, between the fiscal year that ended 2012 up to today, we've gone from that uh, 10.19 mils down to 9.9991. And so that uh, shows you, you know, what would happen to the millage rate if city council approves 9 tenths, 1 mil, 1.1 mil, 1.2 mil. And because uh, the debt millage uh, is ending this year, um, you know, the, the nine tenths and the one mil option mean that the millage, the total millage rate for the city will still go down. At 1.1, it's a tick above flat. And at 1.2, it goes up to um, 10.1386 mils, which you can see is roughly on par with where we started in the fiscal year that ended 2012. Now, frankly, you know, when we talk about millage rate, it's, it's tricky because this is one half of an equation. It's taxable value divided by a thousand times the millage rate, and that's the tax bill that people pay. And that's what we hear about when people email us is about their tax bill. I pay X amount of dollars. And when we talked about, you know, the, the average cost, $13 a month or, or whatever, uh, it's dollars. So, you know, back in the fiscal year ended 2012, people were paying taxes based on a lower taxable value. So that other side of the equation has increased since then. But just looking at the rate, this is, this is what it looks like. And thanks, IT, for pulling that up. Yes, thank you. Uh, can we go back? To, yeah, there we go. Uh, Councilmember Hoderick, did you have more at this time? Yes, I just, I just want to. Um, I'm the broken record on this. I want to remind um, everyone that it is important that we make sure we fund the library in a fiscally responsible way. That, you know, if we could sit here and say, oh, we'll figure it out and pull the money out of the seat cushions of whatever part of the budget in City Hall that we can, and we'll figure it out year by year, you know, that would be great. Um, we cannot do that and protect our AAA bond rating at the same time. And um, that was a, a, a point of debate 10 years ago when these discussions first went on. Five years ago, when the millage rate was renewed, uh, millage level was renewed, there was no discussion. And I'm, I'm hoping and trusting it's because the community has, has come to wrap its head around the fact that what a gem our AAA bond rating is. And um, year over year, 
entities where we need to make sure we're funding it year after year after year um, can't, can't come from just finding it somewhere in the budget. And we were already augmenting um, the limp along millage rate, probably at the risk, at some risk. And so it is really critical to me that we move past um, any suggestion that we are being fiscally irresponsible. So the AAA bond rating, in addition to what I pay in my taxes, really matters to me because um, you know, we need to be fiercely, as a council, as fellow um, community members, um, protective of that. We don't know when we might want to and need to really leverage that. Um, there was a study session a few years back with uh, the then city council, and I think I'm the only one on council now that participated in it um, with an outside person that came in and talked to us um, and affirmed that it's very critical that we not try to fund the library in that kind of piecemeal way, that we need to have dedicated um, a dedicated millage for it. Um, I've seen now three different CFOs come in and confirm that. Um, I think I'm looking at a fourth city manager that confirms that, um, an assistant city manager that has confirmed that. And there's a lot of fresh faces sitting at the table and giving this a fresh look. And I just wanna say that out loud to anyone watching that that's a piece of this um, consideration that we have to make. One mill might seem like more than sufficient right now. If we're looking at doing a 10 year millage, 1.1 might really be the fiscally responsible way to go especially with Headley in the mix. Thank you, Council Member Hoderick. Uh, who's next? Once up, Council Member Brooks. Thank you, Mayor. Um, well, I, you know, listening to all of these uh, presentations, um, it's been very informative. Um, I've really enjoyed hearing from residents, what residents want. Um, and obviously, you know, we're looking primarily at three options. There's the 0.9, the one, and the 1.1. The 0.9 does not appear to have a lot of support from our residents. Um, I am concerned about the 0.9 because of the fact that it really does not allow for a fully funded library. Um, it does not, you know, replenish the fund balance. And, you know, it only allows for operational costs. And my concern is that down the road, um, we'll be in the same place over and over with the 0.9. So really kind of we're looking at the one and the 1.1. Um, there does seem to be a good amount of support for both. Um, and my concern with the one is essentially with Headley. Because if if the one is maybe, you know, like, like um, Council Member Hoderick said, may seem sufficient now, but you know, with Headley rollbacks, then you're kind of potentially pushing back into the 0.9 area. And my concern is that it's very important from a financial standpoint, and you know, with our you know being fiscally responsible, to have a fully funded independent library, because if we consistently are pulling in from the general funds for you know various, um, you know resources or things that they need um, as projects that they need, such as, you know, the, the, um, the, the, um, the, the roof um, that we had to do um, recently, then that uh, does affect, you know, our standing and our AAA bond rating potentially. And so I think that it's very important from a fiscally responsible standpoint, standpoint to allow for a fully functional independent library. And so I do think that um, the 1.1, in my opinion, seems most appropriate and most responsible. Um, and there is a lot of support, it seems like, from residents. Um, and so that's, that's what kind of pushes me more into the 1.1, is mainly because I'm concerned about Headley rollbacks. Um, and obviously I do support the tenure. Um, it seems to be, you know, the most responsible thing to do. It allows for better planning for the library. And, you know, there's less voter fatigue. 
Um, I think it can save taxpayer money from, you know, having to keep putting these things back on the ballot every five years. Um, so I think overall, you know, doing the 10 year and potentially the 1.1, I think I could definitely support, but ultimately, obviously it is up to voters. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Chamberlain Kranga. Thank you, Mayor. Um, like my colleagues, when it comes to the millage duration, I definitely agree that 10 years is really the option. The option to really support our library with its planning and to be able to think long term and what it needs to do. And as Council Member Brooks just shared, the voter fatigue. And I think the misunderstanding that sometimes voters have when they hear that there is another millage um, up, up to vote on and not understanding what that always means. So keeping it ten, putting it 10 years, I think is the best um, bet forward with that. In terms of the millage um, rate, that's the one I've been debating about. Um, and I go back to a study that was shared with us. It was done by Bond Consulting an Impact Analysis and talked about high impact libraries versus low impact libraries. And it said the three things that really prevented us from being a high impact library, despite we have all the demographics, everything, uh, our, the city of our size that would suggest that we should have that high impact library is that really it's our operational hours keep us back. It's our days and it's, it's our, our funding. That high impact libraries receive 41% more funding than what we do at the Troy Public Library. And so thinking of that for me and what our residents had to say, it was clear that the options are between one mil or 1.1. And as I was debating between the two, on the one hand, as Council Member Hudrick said, is when you look at the comments, given that it's COVID right now, um, you know, there were a good number of comments just saying that this is a difficult time and, um, and knowing that there, there has been a history where it's been difficult, kind of sometimes getting this across the, the finish line. But there are moments I thought, well, maybe, maybe it is one, one mil. Um, but as we talk about Headley and as we talk about that, really technically 1.2 is would be and i, I don't want to entertain that because that's something we've not taken to our residents but that is that would actually be the rate if you adjust for inflation that would get us back to uh, to the level um to be able to accrue the assets that we want that what if i debate between the one and 1.1 then it has to be a 1.1 if we think of inflation if we think about Hadley and moving forward and so i think though if we choose that 1.1 the onus will be on us in terms of education, being able to mobilize as, as best we can within recognizing the limits and what we can advocate for, but putting out mailers and having the infographics to help to educate our residents out there. So I think that choosing 1.1, I th just think that we will have to um, just be very intentional in how we, and how we educate um, our residents but I'm happy to support 1.1 in a 10 year duration. Thank you. Council Member Abraham. Thank you, Mayor. The Troy Public Library has been something that's been top of mind for me for literally 10 years. It's, it's the thing that got me from being a passive resident to one that became engaged, to one that became uh, a follower of city budgets and a regular attendee of council meetings. It led me to support a millage in 2011 with a group of citizen activists, grassroots. It led me eventually to be sitting here at the council table. So the library hasn't just been top of mind for me for 10 years, it's, it's been at the forefront. And I remember um, going to this library as a child. I remember when the new wing of the library opened up in 1984 and thought, there's no way we'll ever need all this space. It's huge. And here we are today, nearly 40 years later with that same library and that same furniture. <laughs> I really do appreciate this, the study that was done, Cobalt Research did a phenomenal job. And I really appreciate how the data was laid out for us with heat maps, with that level of um, granularity by demographics. As someone who absolutely loves to marinate in data, you gave me plenty to think about. 
and the results and the summary, um, it's very striking. Very rarely do you see such consistency in numbers amongst demographics. I, I was quite honestly floored just based off of last week's study session. And then when we got to look at the cross tabs and the data within, it, it solidified that feeling of support that our residents truly have for the library. Our residents value the library. 80% um, just from that survey said, if the if, uh, election was held today, 80% would support. We've come a long way since Prop A in 2010. 80% is striking. There are a few things that became very clear to me. It's one, our residents agree that the status quo is not sufficient. And that status quo translates to that 0.9 millage rate that uh, was our first option. So to me, the 0.9 mil is a non-starter. That, that got ruled out very quickly based off that data. What was also very clear to me is that not only do our residents want sustainability and sustained funding for the library, they understand what that means far more than they did in 2010. Because if you think about it, we've already had referendums on library millages this will be the fourth one. We had it in 2010 with Prop A. We had it with 2011 where we got the 0.7 mils uh, passed. And then in 2015 where it got renewed. And here we are four time. And each time the level of support for a dedicated millage increase. So it's, it's very clear our residents want that sustainability and really understand what it means. So to me, I think this has to be a 10 year millage. I think within the past 10 years, this is our fourth vote. Our, our residents understand what's at stake. And I think I'm very comfortable saying a 10 year millage is appropriate. But I do struggle with, is it 1.0 or is it 1.1? I'm very cognizant of the status of the economy today because of COVID-19 mm -hmm. and should our economic situation be suppressed for longer than we'd want it to be, that may impact whether or not Headley is even a factor at all. Now, we may bounce back more quickly than anticipated, and that would be a factor. And that would be fantastic. And then Headley does become a factor, which would make me lean more towards the 1.1. I do appreciate all of my my colleagues' comments, um, I, I have to admit to still being torn between the 1.0 and the 1.1. And I'm wondering if it's possible for the agenda next week, if we do have an option A and an option B, as we have done you know, with other agenda items um, that require a vote where one option is the 1.0 at 10 years and the, the second option is 1.1 at 10 years. And that gives council time to consider what might be best and which option they might want to bring forward. So that's where my head is at. Thank you, Council Member Abraham. And let me start, I think I can answer if we ask them to provide us two options at the next meeting, I think they'll do it and, uh, without us even having to tell them. So <laughs> that's, uh, that's a good point. Um, that's everybody, right? Yeah, I think so. Well, so I'm um, I, amazing comments by all of you. Um, and it shows to me the, the breadth of the consideration and the all of your thought processes that have gone into coming up with these um, comments. I mean, you clearly have all looked at the data, talked to residents, and really are all engaged, which I think is something great about our council right now. We are all all in this 110%, and that when we have a city staff who's also working at that same level, it, it should create a good product for our residents to look at. Um, I am amazed by the survey results knowing what the city's gone through over the past 10 years. Um, and I'm amazed in a good way. But to see 
like Councilmember Abraham just said, when you, you see the level of support increase with each vote of the people, um, and then you even see the survey results with you know an 80%, well, yes, of course, basically, we, we do a dedicated library millage. That does say that the community has grasped um, how important it is to have dedicated funding um, for sustainability of the library, to keep our AAA bond rating in check and the value of that in our community and our city and what that does and how that actually can save us so much more money at other times when necessary. Um, and you see the, the, you just see the level of support and enthusiasm in the, in the amount of surveys that were returned, the people that have offered up their, their opinions in the focus groups and you, you, you have a community that loves our library. Um, and I think that's really amazing. Um, you know, I, if I thought we could fund the library responsibly and consistently out of the general fund each year, I would do it in a heartbeat. I think that any one of us would. Nobody here is looking to, to have a, a millage just because. If the money was in the general fund, that's where the focus would be. But we've had council members over the past 10 years um, who have been very um, diligent about looking for that, that extra change in the seat cushions, basically, to make this happen in the general fund. And it's, it's never been found. Um, and there's been council members who, and you know what, for fun, and I mean this in all sincerity, council member Henderson, council member Teets, council member Fleming, they all were on council with a keen eye towards looking for that extra money in the general fund debate. We didn't find it. When I got on council, it still wasn't there. And I want the community to know that people who you value and listen to on certain aspects um, have looked at this issue a lot over the past 10 years and have tried every way to make it work out of our general fund. But the money is just not there like it was 12, 13 years ago when we had a different property uh, portfolio and, and the economy was very different. We talk a lot about you know, the Great Recession of 08 and 09 and what that did. And we hear people in the community today say, because you're doing all this development, you must be flushed with cash. And when you look at those numbers, um, if you just look at the real dollars, you see we're still, I think, at 8% below where we were in 2006, 2007. My years may be off, but it, forgive me if I am. And if you look at it for it, adjusted for inflation, I think we're about 30% less than where we were. So the money is not there in the general fund to, to support the library as it did prior to the 2008 and nine Great Recession. We, we as a community, I think, have understand, understand that now and accept that, but I always want to put it out there as a reminder to everybody that this, if the money was there, we, that we'd be going there first because that's where we budget everything else out of for our city. Um, but it, it's not. So we do need to have dedicated millage. That's the fiscally responsible thing to do. It's the, um, it's, the, it's the most important thing we can do to ensure that we have that world-class library in our city that our residents use and enjoy that makes us stand out as a community who values um, reading, community gathering, uh, education, and all of the wonderful things that a library can bring to a city. So we look at, so where does that leave me on a number of things? I, I, um, I do think 10 years is the way to go um, for duration. I don't think there's a, we talked, I think at the last meeting, if you do a five year, pretty much as soon as it passes and gets implemented, you already have to start looking at the next renewal. And that that's a waste of our city management resources. Um, it was just brought up that it's a waste of taxpayer dollars and having to fund these studies and do things like that. And, you know, my concern initially with a 10 year was, well, what if there's, I mean, a lot of heavily issues and what do we do then? We always have the option as a city or a city council to go back and make adjustments with the vote of the people if we need to. So I'm, I'm not as worried about that anymore. I think 10 years is consistent with what other communities of our style and size do. And I think that it will give the voters a good sense of security that they know exactly what their library is gonna have for these years, less heavily issues, but they, they have a better idea. And frankly, they don't have to worry about it every couple of years with an election comes up. Our, it shouldn't be an issue at this point, in my opinion, whether or not the library millage, the library millage shouldn't play a factor in our city council elections like it has in the past. I think our community at this point is focused on the value of our library. And if we can take away that political football, I think the community will be better served. So 10 years for me. Like some others, um, 
I am extremely torn between 1.0 and 1.1. I'm actually leaning towards 1.0 and for a couple of reasons, and I'll, I'll tell you those. I, I love the idea of 1.1 and you see the additional funds it can create for our library and what we could do with those funds. But I, I look at it a little bit differently. I look at, you know, I, I think our library needs a major renovation and overhaul, or we even need to consider at some point a new library altogether. And I don't think a, a 1.1 millage rate, I don't think it will generate the amount of money in the time period we want to do that major renovation. Although it does give us more funds, I think it was about, um, I don't remember off the top of my head, the slide's not handy, but you know, several million dollars over 10 years, that is over 10 years. And you know, you're, you're not gonna get that big bang punch of a renovation with those funds at $500,000 a year or even a million dollars a year. I, it's just, it's not, it, it's not gonna give that kind of wow factor that I think our community would expect if we're increasing the millage rate to this and saying we're gonna be, be able to do some renovations with this. So I, I think that the 1.1 is not the right answer for our community for that purpose. And in a separate conversation, we do need to look at whether we need a separate renovation bond or some kind of new library bond to do something different for the structure itself. Um, so that's why I favor a 1.0. We get the seven days that I've long advocated for. We fund it the proper way, not by using general fund dollars on a hodgepodge basis or taking out a signed fund balance that should be used for one-time capital expenses or one-time budget shortfalls. We, we use it with the dedicated funds. We get the seven days. We put the library on an operationally secure tax with the funding it needs to have a very good collection, the maintenance it needs, um, and recognizing that our city budget, we still have capital funds in our city budget that can be used for the library for other capital projects. Nothing prohibits us from doing that. Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm way leaning towards 1.0 as opposed to the 1.1. I think that I don't think we could, with that extra 0.1 millage, I don't think it gives us the renovation funds that our community would expect if we were to talk about, oh, this extra money will give us renovations and such. So I'm far more comfortable with a 1.0 millage. I think if you look back, back to what the library was originally supposed to be 10 years ago, it was also around a 1.0 millage. Um, that makes sense to have the seven day library we need in our community. Obviously, five of the half of you spoke before me saying 1.1 is where you're leaning. So we can look at that. Um, I would also ask, and I think it'd be nice to have both options on our agenda next week, which will give two weeks of conversations with residents. And we can hear from the community, let them look at that difference. And it'll also give all of us the opportunity to really take a look. And obviously from a procedural standpoint, even if we only had one option on the next agenda, we could amend it as necessary at the time. But that's where I am. Um, I'm very proud of our library. I'm proud of our library staff and our library director. I think they have worked miracles with the limited funds that they have had over the past several years. And I don't think we can thank Kathy Russ and her team enough for that. Um, the fact that we're having this conversation now and talking about making it bigger and better shows me that we're in a, in a much better place in our community. And that also makes me very happy because I see, I see the joy in some faces on this council who have been through some of the wars in the past and to see that we're at a place where it seems like we have great community support and a council that's a, got a cohesion message on this, I think I think we're in a wonderful place. So with that, city management, does that give you the direction you need coming out of tonight? It should. I mean, 1.0 for 10 years or 1.1 for 10 years. Um, Assistant City Manager Bruner? Yeah, um, I, I think I'm pretty clear, and I'll let Mark and Lori uh, answer that as well. There, there was a couple other things I wanted to add. Um, it, it, having heard all the comments from the council members, a couple of things I thought were worth pointing out. One is that a dedicated library millage is the rule, not the exception. Most of our peer libraries, our communities have dedicated library millages. And if you look at the survey responses, they mentioned places like Bloomfield and Birmingham. Now, both those communities and the other communities served by Birmingham have dedicated library millages. And the average taxpayer in those communities pays more than the average taxpayer in Troy does, a lot more. And 
just leave it at that. The uh, the other thing that, that I want to point out, and the point that you made, Mr. Mayor, is that a new library would cost fifty to sixty million dollars. If uh, you go back to a uh, report we prepared uh, back on June seventeenth about the library space needs assessment and facility uh, that was done several years ago. There were some estimates in, in that uh, study uh, from 2008, and when adjusted for inflation, price tag for those options comes out to 50 to $60 million. Compare that to um, you know, the options that we're talking about tonight, just as an example, 1.1 mil might generate $8 million over the course of 10 years. So I've tried to be very clear about this from the very, very beginning. None of these options get anywhere near a complete renovation or expansion or, or new library. So I just wanted to, um, you know, kind of remind folks of, of the, it, it's, you know, 50 to $60 million and eight to $10 million is, is apples and, and oranges. So we can get some nice upgrades, uh, uh, for eight or ten million dollars, but not a wholesale renovation. And just a quick follow up on that. I think it's important. I thank you, Bob, for those numbers. And certainly, I'm not advocating or proposing for anything like that tonight. I'm just saying I don't think we've had a community conversation about that. And we have to look at the fact that our library, at least half of it, it will be 50 years old next year. Looking forward to a big celebration, Kathy. Um, but it's uh, yeah, at some point. You know, we, we as a city and a community need to decide if we are going to continue to renovate and put money into the piece together library that we have now, or do we want to look at something different? So without, obviously this not, tonight's not the night for those numbers and that conversation, but it is something that we didn't address with the survey. Uh, maybe that can be addressed in the survey, the broader community survey or something. We can talk a little bit about that when we get to that. But um, for me, I just, I, I thought that's what you, well. I already explained it at length, but thank you for that. And I just wanted to clarify on that as well. So um, with that said, I think we don't have to vote on anything in I-6. I'm gonna uh, take a five minute recess. Um, we'll be back in five minutes. It's uh, 9.37, okay? Thank you.
We are back on the record at the Troy City Council meeting. Um, next up on the agenda is the consent agenda. Would anyone like to pull a consent item this evening? Uh, I actually, I'm going to pull the late submittal J3, um, which is a proposed proclamation. So um, we'll talk, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but in the meantime, uh, anyone like to move the consent agenda? I'll do it. Uh, I'll, you know, I'll do it. I, I'd like to move the consent agenda um, as printed in the agenda packet, less the late submittal of J3, which will be voted on and discussed at a separate um, action. Support. Uh, moved by the chair, supported by council member Erickson Galt, that we approve the consent agenda as printed in the agenda packet, less the late submittal of J3, which will be voted on in the future of, of, afterwards. Any discussion? The vote, Ms. Dixon. Councilmember Hoderick? Yes. Mayor Baker? Yes. Councilmember Abraham? Yes. Councilmember Brooks? Yes. Councilmember Chamberlain Kranga? Yes. yes. Councilmember Erickson Gall? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Hamilton? Yes. Motion carries. So the consent agenda items have uh, been all been approved except for J3, which I'll like to discuss now, which was a late submittal. Um, I think it's a fantastic proclamation. I love that. I love Michigan's role in the women's suffrage movement, how we were early as a state. Um, I was just wondering if we could maybe tweak and add a couple things to it only because um, I think it could make it that much better. And, you know, here we are in Troy, Troy City Council discussing Troy issues. And in the paragraph where it talks about um, including the majority of this city council, um, I would love to be able to add a line about um, Jean Stein, who was the first um, council woman who came onto Troy City Council. And does anybody know offhand what year that was? I, I should know, and I didn't look it up, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can figure out in a second. And as our first council woman and also our first um, mayor as a woman i think if we could add that in i think it would make this that much more important for the city of troy and i think it would be a nice um acknowledgement again of the role she's played in um some amazing strong uh, women leadership in our city as evidenced by all the the, the women on the screen right now um and and the other thing is nitpicky of me there's two it talks about our democracy and technically the united states is a democratic republic and i I have a couple people in this city who every time I say democracy, I get a mean email about it. And I'd really love it if we could change in those last two paragraphs where it says our democracy, if we could change that to our democratic republic. And I know that sounds nitpicky, but you know, that, as we have to do that. So um, I'd like to propose amending J3, the late submittal um, to say, um, except now I need to, I'm sorry, I shouldn't do this from the table. Um, so it happens when you look at things and you're working through some things right at the last, right before the meeting starts. But um, in the paragraph where it says, including the majority of this city council, maybe we could do, it would be amended to say, uh, comma, recognizing the leadership of former mayor and councilwoman Jean Stein who was the first woman elected to Troy City Council in 1976, I think. Six, I think it was six too, and became Troy's first woman mayor in 1990 something. We'll look that up too, comma, and then, and following in the footsteps of our resolute suffragist sisters. But that, I, that would be my proposed amendment. Um, I think it would be a nice Troy tie-in. And otherwise, I'm, I think this is a great resolution. So could I get support for that? Support, yeah. yeah. Great, yeah. so moved by, the, moved by the chair, supported by Mayor Pertz and Hamilton, that we make those changes that I just hopefully read into the record and City Clerk Dixon was able to take down. Um, and uh, any discussion on that? Council Member Erickson Gall. Uh, I'd just like to say as the author of the proposed resolution. Oh, oh, very good. <laughs> Big shocker there. Um, I, I I love your amendments, um, and I I love that Troy has been a leader in uh, in having women leaders. That 
Jean Stein uh, became a leader in the city at a time where few women were leading anywhere in this country. So, so thank you for adding that. It, to me, it's always striking when you look at the the wall on the back of council chambers and you see you see five in a row of a very particular look, <laughs> and then all of a sudden you see Jean Stein up there as mayor, and you think. Wow, and then you see some changes after that. So she was revolutionary and a trailblazer in, in the leadership, and, and uh, she continues to be at 91 years old. So um, the vote mistakes. Oh, Council Member Hodrick. Yeah, I just I think that is a very good change, and you know we could name. Um, I'm very humbled at the women that came ahead of us. Um, just some brilliant council people and mayors who have. Um, mentored and encouraged in not only women, but men um, who are very, very encouraging. And, you know, a couple of you are okay to work with here in this council. Um, but no, truthfully, this has been a, a wonderful community to volunteer in on boards, to um, step up and um, to work to be elected in um, you know, as a woman, woman, it can, it's not a natural thing for women to do all the time. And we do need encouragement. And I, I just want to point out that there's just some amazing people that came ahead of us that were so encouraging and mentoring. And, um, and I'm grateful for them. And, you know, I'm mindful now that I need to turn around and do the same. And I am trying to, to share knowledge and being encouraged of people, men and women, but, um, uh, we really do live in a wonderful community in that regard where um, you know, the, the diversity comes together and gender is one of them and it's, it's a beautiful thing. We really live in a nice place there in that regard. So thank you for drafting that and thank you for that addition, Mayor Baker, because I think adding her name specifically kind of is the umbrella name for all those women that have, have come behind. So thank you. Very good. Uh, the vote, Ms. Dixon, on the amendment? And the, are we voting on the amendment first or we just vote on one, it's, it's just the whole thing, right? This will, this will be on the amendment. Okay. Mayor Baker? Yes. Councilmember Abraham? Yes. Councilmember Brooks? Yes. Councilmember Chamberlain Kranga? Yes. Councilmember Erickson Galt? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Hamilton? Yes. Councilmember Hoderick? Yes. Okay, so if I'm, at, if I'm correct now, we need to move J3 as amended. Correct. All right, Council Member Erickson Gall, would you like to move J3 as amended since you were the original author? I would love to. Um, get my agenda up so I know what I'm talking about here. <laughs> <laughs> Giving us great confidence there. <laughs> should I, uh, just a point of clarification, should I read the entire thing into? Since no, I think I'll, I'll read it in presentations at the next meeting if it's just, okay. this is just the proposed one. So. Okay, great. So I would like to move J3A. Is that? I'm trying to make sure I've got the right. Uh, J, yes, J3A proclamation to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, securing the right of women to vote as amended. Support. Moved by Councilmember Erickson Gall, supported by Councilmember Abraham that we approve J3A as amended. Um, any further discussion? Uh, Councilmember Chamberlain Kranga. I did just want to say is I, and I know I'm yellow. I turned yellow. That was unintentional, mm -hmm. but I do have my yellow rose on, which is what um, a person, man or woman who supported the suffragette movement wore in sort of commemoration and support of them. So I have, I have one today and um, there's nice, um, nice pins that you can have just to remember these hundred years. So I thank council member Erickson Galt for bringing this to the table and also wanted to say is that in the past couple of weeks, I've received a number of emails from people just asking for advice on getting involved in local politics or doing surveys. And they've all been from women, young women um, in high school here in Troy who are interested in, um, in reaching out. And so I just think that says a lot about how far our, our country has come in a hundred years. Very good. Uh, the vote, Ms. Dixon. Councilmember Abraham? 
Yes. Councilmember Brooks? Yes. Councilmember Chamberlain Kranga? Yes. Councilmember Erickson Galt? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Hamilton? Yes. Councilmember Hoderick? Yes. Mayor Baker? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you, Ann, for, for bringing that up. Um, there are no memorandums and future council agenda items this evening. And uh, we handled public comment earlier. No council referrals this evening. So we move on to council comments. I'd like to speak to council comments. I want to actually go with a first minor comment and say happy birthday to our city attorney, Lori Greg Bloom, who's enjoying a wonderful birthday evening sitting here at a Troy City Council meeting on her laptop. So thank you and happy birthday, city attorney Bloom. And I'll reserve the rest of my time for comments afterwards. So uh, council member Brooks, was that you to put your hand up? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, I actually was going to respond to the pub to the um, public hearings um, and public comments, but um, I don't think you saw my hand up, so that's oh, okay. I'm so, so, I, I'm so sorry. Yeah. That's okay. That's okay. I saved it till now. I did want to respond to a Mr. Walters um, and say, uh, first of all, thank you uh, for the support, and I do obviously agree that there is a racial divide in this country um, that hopefully we're working towards uh, healing. Um, but also I did want to, you know, also say that, you know, I am in full support of our current mayor, Ethan Baker, and the rest of my council members. I think all of us are on the same page as far as our commitment to diversity and celebrating the diversity we have in our community. And, you know, I am very encouraged that Troy is moving in the right direction. So that is just something that I wanted to say. Very, very nice, Teresa. I wish I would have seen your hand earlier, but <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> no, thank you. I, I appreciate it very much. Uh, Council Member Chamberlain Trianga. Thank you, Mayor. And do you want to say as clarification? So it, this is the city computer, and I'm again sorry to everyone that I've turned yellow. And it, and what I wanted to share last meeting on my appointed term on City Council, and just wanted to take just a brief moment to just thank each and every one of you for believing in me, for unanimously appointing me to council. This has been one of the most rewarding experiences of my life and what a time it's been. Little did I know when I put my name in the hat, um, just following in my father's footsteps and just being passionate about municipal politics and governance, that it'd be in the midst of a global pandemic, <laughs> the worst crisis we have faced in a lifetime in Troy. But it has really brought us all the closer, and it's been such a joy to work with our city management, city administration, each and every one of you, your dedication, your expertise. And I will never, ever forget this beautiful moment um, and moments that we have shared together. So I just want to thank, thank each and every one of you. Very good. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Hamilton. Yeah, but I just wanted to remind residents that a week from tomorrow, Tuesday, August 4th, is the state primary election, including a special election for city council. So I encourage everyone due to the pandemic to vote um, either by, we're getting to the point where vote by mail is going to be difficult because the U.S. Postal Service is delayed with COVID-19. So um, you have until Friday, I believe at 5 p.m. to turn in your application to get a ballot by mail. Um, but at this point, uh, if you do receive an application, if you do receive a ballot in the mail, it's probably your, in your best interest to use one of the two drop boxes at City Hall. On the west side of City Hall, there's a drive through drop box, which I use almost every election. On the east side, there's a walk up one. Um, that will ensure your ballot is in possession of the city clerk by 8 p.m. on August 4th, which is what is required. Um, you can always also come to City Hall to the city clerk. I believe you can vote. Um, outside, and I, I'll ask Clark Dickinson if she can detail all the options that voters have for the next eight days to come and vote in person. Uh, but I really do encourage you, if you have your ballot now, it's probably not a great idea to mail it in. Um, I know I, I mailed mine in a couple weeks ago, and it took a week before I saw on the state website that it was accepted. So if you mail it in today, there's a risk that it won't get to the city clerk by 8 p.m. So. Clerk Dixon, could you detail what the options are for the next eight days for voters? Thank you. Sure, thank you, Mayor, Council. Um, at this point, uh, we have begun encouraging voters as they call and contact us to um, 
come in person to get their ballots and to use the drop boxes um, to return their ballots. Uh, we are open, our, even though City Hall is close to the public, we are still there and we are helping people at the door. So when you arrive at City Hall, you just call 248-524-3316 and one of us will get all the materials you need in order to get your ballot and then we will come down and bring your ballot down to you and we can do the whole transaction at the door. On uh, Saturday, August 1st, we're open from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. And we're going to be doing a drive-through event at that point, um, similar to the one that we just had this past Saturday. Um, and during that, you don't need to call ahead. You can just come and get in line. We are all there waiting to help you. And we have everything that we need down at the doors to City Hall um, where we can issue ballots to people while they wait in their cars. We'll have some voting booths outside in case you wanted to vote while you were standing there, or you could sit in your car and vote, or you could take it home and then drop it back off to the drop box. Um, and uh, as Mayor Pro Tem Hamilton said, on Friday at 5 p.m. is the last time that we can mail a ballot out to people. Uh, we try to contact voters when they send us applications um, that they want mailed, encouraging them to instead come in person if they can. Um, and then on Saturday, you can vote uh, you can pick up your ballot and take it home until 4 p.m. On Monday, you can actually get an absentee ballot, but you have to vote it at City Hall. So you can't take it home with you. Um, you would have to vote it right there and then return it to us right away. And we can do that until 4 p.m. And then after 4 p.m., the only people that would be able to get absentee ballots would be people that are registering to vote for the first time. Very good. City Clerk Dixon has a follow up. Um, I saw, I heard great things about Saturday's uh, drive-through clerk's office, which I think is really, really cool, and a great, great job you did leading that, and we're doing it again this Saturday. Could you speak to um, how many ballots you've sent out at this point, or what our numbers are looking like? I'm so, curious. As of t the last time I checked was this afternoon, we had issued 21,500 ballots. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, um, for this election, in 2016, we issued um, something like 6,000 ballots. So that's quite a substantial increase over what we would have been used to getting. Um, we have about 35% of those back. So if you have an absentee ballot in your hands right now and you want to vote it, I would encourage you to vote it and get it back to us as soon as possible. Um, they have to be back to us by 8 p.m. on Tuesday. I should have said that before. Uh, on Saturday, we had a uh, for, we had kind of a trial period for a trial four-hour drive-through event, and we, served, we helped 30 people get their ballots. We answered lots of questions. Um, it, everyone had very positive things to say. We had a lot of attention on social media as well um, about this event, so we're hoping to repeat that and increase our numbers on Saturday and help even more people in person. We've had a lot of interest this week from people who – either um, didn't receive their ballot in the mail and needed to spoil it and get a new one, or they made a mistake on their ballot and wanted to spoil it and get a new one, or suddenly decided that they needed to get a ballot um, and they're going to be able to come in person on Saturday outside of their work hours, of course, and um, be able to come in and um, sit in their car and it's completely safe. We have um, contactless delivery of your ballots to you. So, uh, it's, and it was a fun event, honestly. So if I can, a, a, another, um, just as a the reminder, and maybe you, if you can touch on it or not, but so there, this is a, a partisan primary. So there's, you can only vote on one side as a reminder to everybody. You can only vote on one side of the ballot, either in the Democrat or the Republican side, but there's also nonpartisan races on here. So after you do your partisan voting, make sure you go on to the nonpartisan. Um, it's very important, which will include the remaining term um, for the city council position. So. Don't just do the partisan, make sure you do the nonpartisan too. And then uh, my final question for you, City Clerk Dixon, um, all of our polling locations will still be open on Tuesday, August 4th, regular hours. Will they be fully staffed as normal or should we expect additional wait times? If, I mean, or what's the plan for that? So um, to address the first question about the, um, the ballot itself, uh, Oakland County sent a postcard out. I got mine today. So you probably have your postcard in your mailbox right now. And it, they do a really good job of providing a graphic that shows what the top of your ballot would look like and how you have to choose, if you're on the partisan section, you have to choose one column. Um, there's a column for 
the Democratic Party and a column for the Republican Party. You just have to, if you're going to vote in the partisan section, you have to choose one column and stick with it through the whole ballot. So you can't switch back and forth between parties. That is almost complete. It's completely separate from the nonpartisan section, which you could vote regardless of whether you vote the partisan section or not. Mm -hmm. And the, the nonpartisan section has judges races and any questions if school districts have a question on there. And then also the council races in the nonpartisan section. Um, so the most important thing, the thing that people get confused by is that it's only um, every two years in August where we have a situation where you have to choose a column in the, you have to choose a party column in the partisan section and stick with it through the entire ballot. Um, and then, um, what was the other question? I'm sorry. Only functional uh, yes, in-person. Yes, sorry. <laughs> yes, yeah, so we have all 31 uh, precincts will be open, staffed as much as we can. We've had a lot of election inspectors um, say that they are not comfortable working in the precincts um, because of the pandemic. So we have as much staffing as we can get out in the precincts, fully staffed. All precincts are in their regular locations. The only exception to that is the precincts 26, 27, and 30, which are housed in the community center, are still housed in the community center. But instead of going into the east banquet entrance, they will be coming, the voters will be redirected by signage to go to the north entrance and they'll be in the cafeteria. So same building, same address, just a different door. Um, other than that, everything will be operating the same. Um, we are uh, prepared to have a large crowd. We don't know exactly what will happen um, because, you know, this all of my statistics over the last 20 years have all been thrown out the window. So um, we're preparing for um, a, a large crowd and we'll be ready if that happens. And if it doesn't happen, then um, hopefully we'll be telling the inspectors to bring a book to read. So, but um we, we will, we are prepared for, we're trying to prepare for everything. <laughs> so for any, uh, um, anything that could possibly happen that day. Very good. Thank you. Appreciate that. We wouldn't normally spend so much time having an update on that, but this is like an election we've never had before under the circumstances. So really appreciate yep. that. Um, did you have anything else, Mary Portson Hamilton? No, that was it. I covered everything. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And, and thank you, uh, Councilmember Chamberlain Craig uh, for your volunteering for the last five months. Uh, it was great to have you on council and uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, Councilmember Hodery. Um, one more thing on the election. Sometimes there's confusion and I hear from residents on the night of the election because they go to the city website to look for the results. And it's actually, they need to go over to an Oakland County link and I know that's on the city clerk page, but if there's a way we can help guide people to where the results are, um, that'd be great. So the clerk Dixon, is there, do you wanna to add to that? Thank you, Mayor. Um, we do link on, on our city elections page, we link to the Oakland County elections page because that is the fastest way to get the results. Um, since our election results are transmitted directly from the precincts to the county, um, we, that's why we link to that county page because their results on their web page pull directly from the um, computer system they have that receives the transmissions from our precincts. So the fastest way to get results is to go to the county page. Um, they, their county page um, over in the last couple of years, they've um, improved it so that you can really, um, it's really a lot easier to drill down into um, your specific municipality. So uh, when we, link to that it's um, we always try to link to the area where if you click on you click on it once and then it goes right to the troy results you don't have to drill through all of the oakland county results to get to the troy results um but in the just in case anybody is wondering that that's why we link to the oakland county page um for the um absentees that's a little bit different and those end up coming later but it's the same trend it's a different way of transmitting but it shows up the same on the Oakland County page. So uh, we've tried to have um, in an odd year election when there aren't as many contests on the ballot, we will do our own content, we'll, we'll do our own results uh, spreadsheet, but that requires a manual entry. And on an even year election, it's a lot busier in our office. So we don't have the staffing or the time, frankly, to input manually the results into a spreadsheet to post on our website. 
um, which is why we would still, again, be linking to the Oakland County page. Thank you so much for the very thorough update and report. Appreciate it. Any other council comments? Councilmember Erickson Gall. Yes, um, we've been getting a lot of comments uh, directed at us from the public and uh, regarding wearing masks. And I know that a few of us have asked city staff to look into ways to that, if possible, that Troy could uh, enforce the mat, uh, wearing of masks, which our governor has dictated through an executive order. Uh, and I do appreciate the efforts of especially our city attorney looking into this and trying to figure out if there's a way. I just want to, I, I don't think we've had too many incidents, at least as far as I've heard of, but we've had incidents that we've heard of both in other places in Michigan and across the country with people uh, rising to levels of anger and, and violence over this. And I, I just wanna urge our citizens, um, whether you're wearing a mask, whether you're not wearing a mask, whether everybody around you is wearing a mask, please let's all remember that this is about trying to keep ourselves safe and healthy. And if we're getting violently angry with each other, then we defeat the whole purpose of staying safe and healthy. So I want to, first of all, encourage everybody to please wear a mask if possible at all times. The science is behind it. It does help stop the spread of the virus. But more importantly, please, let's all try to keep our uh, tempers down and, and try to focus on the real issue, which is that we need to gather as a community, we need to gather as one people and try to find a way through this COVID crisis as safely as possible. All said. Any other additional comments this evening? Not related to the reports? Okay. Um, we move on to the reports. Any comments on any of the uh, reports specifically? just want to say, as always, I, I love the reports that our city management gives us. I think there's some great information in there. And I always urge our residents to, to look at those on the agenda. Sometimes they may look like they're a throwaway because if they're at the end of the agenda, but there's good information in there. And I think it shows the quality of our city employees and city leadership and the kind of information and the work they're doing. So thank you for those reports very much. Um, there's no closed session this evening. So that leaves us at the end of this meeting. Again, everybody, Thank you uh, as we continue virtually and thank you to the healthcare heroes and the first responders who are always putting their lives on the line and out there risking to keep us safe. Um, so thank you everybody. And uh, with that, we are adjourned. Good night. Good night.